Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening. good evening. We are on lesson three of our end times lesson. Uh, what the Gospels reveal, Jesus taught regarding the end times. And so yesterday we looked at three parables considering the nation of Israel and how God is given them time to accept Jesus Christ, their servant, and they rejected him. And Jesus said that the kingdom of God would be taken from them and given to a people that would bring forth fruit. This is the church. And the church will uh, rule and reign with Christ from the cross to the second coming. And, and so has God forsaken the, the Jewish people? Of course not. The mercy is still available to them that they can repent, believe in Jesus, just like the Gentile can. And so there's one plan of salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ, his redeeming blood to cleanse the conscience of sin. And so now we are going to look at our lesson three, uh, what the Gospels reveal Jesus taught regarding the end times. And basically this is all of going to be in Matthew chapter 24. And so yesterday we looked at the parables, and Jesus began in chapter 21 with the parable of the vine vineyard and how he, how he gave that to the nation of Israel. He expected to receive the fruit of his labor, but they rejected him, and God sent prophets, and he sent more prophets. And finally he said, God, I'll send my son them. They'll, he'll believe him. And when Jesus came, they knew who he was. They said, this is the son, and they took him out and they killed him. And then, of course, Jesus pronounced, what will he do? What will the son of man do? And he said, again, that stone, if it falls on you, it will crush you to pieces. But if you fall on that cornerstone in submission to him, it will save your life. And then he said, from that, I will give it your kingdom to another people that will bring forth fruit. Us, those that fall willingly on our Lord Jesus Christ and repent of our sin. And then we saw the wedding feast and how he had prepared a wedding. And there was a great banquet. Invite those that came in the nation of Israel. They rejected it. And then he said, okay, since they rejected it, go out and to the highway. So the gospel goes to the world. And finally at the End of time, when God announces to his son, it's time to return, nobody else is going to repent. And Jesus comes back for the great wedding feast. We found people, a man there, that didn't have his wedding garment on. So this told us um, that at the end, at the second coming, the godly and the ungodly will be present at once. So this eliminates a secret rapture, because both are living. Both are there. And so that the wedding banquet and Jesus says, hey, friend, where's your wedding garment? And the man was speechless. He had no testimony of what Christ had done in his life. And he said, take him and bind him and cast him into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of the teeth. So at final judgment, we see the entire gospel age in that parable. The entire age when Jesus came to the earth spoke to the Jews, they rejected him, they killed him. Then he said, go out to the highways, invite everybody. And that's what Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And so that is where we are now. We're at that process. And we are now as that bride, we're adorning ourselves for that wedding day with our garments. I don't want to say wedding dress because... <laughs> my wedding gown, my wedding cape. It's white, and it's got to be without spot and blemish. And this is the time where, we, where the bride is adorning herself, preparing herself to meet the Lord. So when we adorn ourselves and we prepare ourselves, is it when we get to heaven? Right. It's right here on earth. If we don't do it on earth, what's going to happen when we die? If we gonna if we die and our and our garments are spotted and, and with blemish and wrinkle, what is is death my savior, or is Jesus my savior? And many people believe death is their savior, and we can't walk in obedience to God while we're on this earth. Akin when I die, 
And so they make death their savior instead of Jesus their savior. And so here on this earth, we're preparing our wedding gown we're without spot and wrinkle. So at the time that Jesus comes, there's that wedding feast and we're all present. He's not going to say, friend, where's your wedding garment? Because we have it on. And he knows us by name. So that's where we saw. Now we come to this great chapter, Matthew 24. And we're going to have some good look at this. I know I did this during Iron Sharpens Iron in September. So it was been introduced. And so you'll hear it for the second time. And I'm sure you'll really, your minds will be open more. So let's begin in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So Jesus had been teaching in chapters 22 and 23 in the temple, mm -hmm. and now he leaves the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him what? The buildings of the temple. Yeah. Here's what I want you to look at, um, verse 2. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. What are these things that Jesus was pointing to? The temple buildings. <clears throat> They're the subject of the matter. And so he said, They won't be left here. Now, one stone in this place. So he's talking about, an end, not talking about an end time event, thousands of years in the future, but these, these particular physical buildings that existed in Jerusalem. Not somewhere in the future. You see these buildings? Mm -hmm. And you got to understand, they were just completed uh, not too long before this I think it was 40 years, but I'm not exactly sure when the buildings, but not too long before Jesus walked this earth. The buildings were just completed. Mm -hmm. And now you're telling the disciples that these buildings are going to be crashed and destroyed? Verse 3, And he sat down upon the uh, Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will be. What will be the sign of the coming and the end of the world? So this is what we want to understand. Three things. Three things. What's the first thing? When? When will these things be? These two double E? T-H-E-S-E. That's not right. T-H-E-S-E. What are these things? When will these things be? The temple comes down. The temple comes down. When was that going to happen? What then is the sign of your coming? And what will it be like? On Judgment Day. Or at the end of the world. So the end of the world to the to them was Judgment Day. Three questions here. When will these things, what things? The temple destruction. When will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And three, the end of the world. Three things that we must have to remember as we finish going through Matthew chapter 24. Now we have to think that the Holy Spirit we know is not a spirit of confusion, is he? No. no. And we've learned in the Word series how, the, how God teaches is sound doctrine. And sound is in order and neatly and in order. And so since these three questions were asked to Jesus. 
How would Jesus answer these three questions? In order. Mm -hmm. Because if you started in the middle, then did this one, it would bring confusion, mm -hmm. would it not? Yes. Of course. And so Jesus is going to begin to answer these in order as they appeared on the questions. Very good. Let's set that down for a minute. And let's go on. The first question is going to be answered from verse 4 to 27. This will be the first question answered. So let's begin in verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So what is the first thing Jesus says? Don't let, Don't let anybody deceive you. Yet, there's no other topic that has brought more deception than end times. I don't know if it's predetermined biases. I don't know what it is, but it has caused a lot of deception in the church. But Jesus said, do not let anybody deceive you. Verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. <laughs> so first, he says, make sure nobody deceives you. Then he says, because many are coming to deceive you. <laughs> so the very first thing that we have to understand when these things will be is deception, or somebody is going to be deceiving. Deceiving. And we can look and see that that had happened. And so in our text, we have some verses here. Let's look at Acts 5.36. Acts 5.36. And it says in Acts 5.36... For before these days rose up Thaddeus, both sent himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. And so here was a man, Thaddeus, who deceived many. If we continue in Acts chapter 5, verse 37, we see after this man, Thaddeus, or after this man, rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of Taxon, and he drew away much people after him. He also perished, and even as many as obeyed him were dispersed. So here we have two witnesses. Let's go to a third witness, Acts 8, 9 through 11. Acts 8, 9 through 11. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, given out that himself was someone great. Verse 10, To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. And so here is our third witness, this man in the book of Acts named Simon who had deceived many, and he was performing some great miracle signs or some type of power. Acts 13, 6 is their fourth witness. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, you child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to prevent to pervert the ways of the Lord. And so we see here that the first thing that would happen when these things will happen, the destruction of the temple, 
Many will come to deceive many. So we see that happened. And this is just what was written for our, for our understanding. Then verse 6, back to Matthew chapter 24. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So the next thing to hear is what? Wars and rumors of wars. And so throughout the ages, men have taken the latest war that's going on in the planet and say, look, we're, we're right here towards the end of the world because this is a war. And you hear it with the Ukraine going on now. You heard it with when 9-11 hit. This is it. This is the war. It's going to end. Because right there it says wars and rumors of wars. And then the end will come. But the reality is that at the time of Jesus walked this earth, there was no time in history of this whole world that, that this world had experienced the peace it did when Jesus walked this earth. The Romans had a name for it called Pax Romana. And that Pax Romana simply meant peace on earth. Now, doesn't that make sense? What was one of Jesus' names? <laughs> Prince of Peace. <laughs> and so when he walked this earth, he was the Prince of Peace, and the world experienced great peace. But when Jesus died, court, I think it's on your outline, 16 major wars broke out along the nation of Israel before the final destruction in 70 AD. And so when Jesus walked this earth, Pax Romana. When Jesus died, and went back to the Father, 16 wars broke out. And so he's not talking again of some time in the distance or in the future. He's talking about before the destruction of the temple. It says here on this that, that there will be wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. And so people see the word end, and their minds jump automatically to the end of the world. But the word end here in the Greek is telos. It's on your outlines, but I want to write it here for, for God, I can't, I don't have room. T-E-L-O-S, telos. And telos means the end or the conclusion of the matter, being discussed. What matter is being discussed? The temple. The temple. He's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the destruction of the temple. So he said, so there's going to be many to come to deceive. There's going to be wars and rumors of the war. But the end, the telos, the end of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD is not going to happen yet. Not the end of the world. Verse 7. It's like me saying, well, the end of Bible study is going to be at 9.30 tonight. And people, is that the end of the world? The end is not yet here. Break time, we're going to end. Do you jump and think that's the end of class? No, it's the matter under discussion. And so I just want to make that clear because it is one of the sticking points in our Bible teaching overseas to our African teachers. Not the end of the world. The end is the matter under discussion. What's the topic? When will these things? The destruction of the temple. Verse 8, verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. So uh, great earthquakes were also reported at this time. So this is the third thing. Earthquakes. 
So I'm sure you can all remember the, the tragic earthquake that hit Haiti a few years ago. And so many of the Bible prophets said, there it is. There's the earthquake. It's the end of the world coming. Because it's right here in Matthew 24. But it has nothing to do with the latest news headline. This is, again, the destruction of the temple. And so we must find a record. Was there earthquakes in the time of the New Testament? And of course, we have um, Romans 15, 25. I don't know if I have that. Romans 15, 25. Gaila, could you read that when you get there? Yes. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And then Acts 11.25. 11.29. They took up the collection because of the earthquake. That's what Paul did. <clears throat> there was an earthquake in Jerusalem, and the saints, were, the brothers, were suffering. And he took up a collection and took it down to the brethren. Eleven twenty-nine. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Again, because of the earthquake that hit at that time. So we see from the Bible that. Earthquakes did happen before the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Back to Matthew 24, 8. And all these things are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. What are the sorrows he's talking about? And this is a reference to the Old Testament. I think it's, these are on your outlines. No? What sorrows? <clears throat> Two are. So we'll look at a few more. So all of Deuteronomy chapter 28 were blessings and cursings. So if they would obey God and walk in his statues and love him, then God would bless them. But if they didn't, then God was going to pronounce judgment. And so all of chapter 28 is blessings and cursings. And then we have uh, that punishment that was going to come upon the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Then we have Jeremiah 30, verse 7, which is in your outline. Mm -hmm. It says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So here was a time of a prophecy of this destruction that would come in 70 AD, but yet Jacob would be saved out of it. So we have to figure out who was Jacob? Who was the real Israel of God? Who was the Jews that were going to be saved out of this time of great sorrow? Was those that would believe in the Christ? The church. It's the New Testament. It will be the New Testament church. But specifically at this time, it was the Jewish New Testament church because the gospel had to first go to the Jew first. And we'll see that when we study Daniel. Then we had Daniel 12, verse 1, about Jacob's trouble. And at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince, which standeth for the children of your people, the Jewish nation, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that is found written in the book. Again, so this book is, I think you learned it last week, and when you did Revelation chapter 20, and Pete preached on the books that were open. 
and those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life. And so the, those that were saved out of this time of trouble that was going to come in 70 AD, your name has to be written in the book of life. And so you had to be born again. And then there was that promise that God would deliver you, and we'll see that how he did. And then Matthew 24, 21 is our last one, which we will read later today. For then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world, as no, nor shall there ever be again. So, so now we have the very next thing to happen was the beginning of Jacob's sorrows. This is the time that the Jews were very familiar with. There's going to come a judgment upon that great nation. Verse 9, back to Matthew 24. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And so here was tribulation and affliction this is throughout all the book of Acts. Stephen was stoned, they killed him. James was cast out, cast down the wall and killed. Persecution, Paul was going from door to door to try to persecute the Christians. So this was great persecution that came upon this nation. Let's read verse 10. And then they, that many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Again, betray one another. History tells us before the Roman armies entered Jerusalem, thousands of Jews had already been killed by one another and by no food. And so they were surrounded inside the walls of Jerusalem and could not leave because there were armies outside all of Jerusalem. And so there was a civil war going on inside of Jerusalem. And, of course, they were betraying one another to, for food, for gold, for possessions. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, this is found in the, a book called The Works of Josephus, a very thick book. There's also another account, but I cannot think of the name. So we know that happened. Verse 11, Josephus was a, pr a priest in the in the nation of Israel, was captured at this time, around 66 AD, was held captive, and they made him write down the account of what the Roman siege was against the nation of Israel. So he was a first-hand eyewitness to what was going on. Verse 11, And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many, and so we have on our outlines here, uh, 1 John 4, 1. Let's read that, 1 John 4, 1. You want to grab that when you get a minute? Yeah, got it. Beloved, believe not every spirit, mm -hmm. but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So here was John's witness that how many? Many. So false prophets had already gone out into the world. Boy, I struggle with my writing. I also have another verse here, 2 Peter 2, 1. So let's read that. You can add it to your outlines. Second Peter 2, 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon himself. So false prophets appeared before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem before 70 AD. Verse 12, And because iniquity shall wax, shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold or a backslide in an apostasy. And this is seen throughout the New Testament. Paul names names that there, 
the blacksmith had abandoned him and others departed. Even Jesus, he had a great following. And then he came out and said, unless you eat of this bread and drink of this blood, you cannot follow me. And everybody left. And he turned, are you going to turn to Peter? And he said, Peter, are you going to leave also? And so there's a great apostasy due to the persecution, what was happening. Verse 13, 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. There's a, a very good word that we all have learned, that if we endure to the end, we shall be saved. Endure to the end of what? Our life? The end of the world? What am I saved from? That means I'll be saved and go to heaven with Jesus? What is he talking about in this word, this verse? The end of this period. The end of this period, the destruction. And so again, there's the word end. It's telos. It's until the death of destruction. A remnant of Jewish believers who endure with God and his word will be saved from the destruction of Jerusalem. That's all it means. So can you imagine what had happened? Jesus died on the cross. Passover was complete. He rose out of the grave. He was the, the fulfillment of the first fruit. Now came Pentecost, 50 days after the cross. So everybody was in Jerusalem with the 50-year jubilee, or 49th-year jubilee. The 50th year would be the time of jubilee. Pentecost happened. The Holy Spirit fell on people. There's millions of people here that did not belong in Israel or Jerusalem at this time. Matter of fact, in that says there was people from every tribe, tongue, and nation under heaven at this time because they came to do the, the celebrations. And so he says, if you endure to the end, you will be saved out of the destruction that's going to take place in Israel. Not the end of the world, not the end of my life, although that is true. <laughs> I have to endure to the end. I have to walk in obedience to God. But he's talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the city that was to come. Now another good one. 14, in the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in the world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. So I'm sure we've all heard this before. Amen. We have to go and we got to get that last tribe in New Guinea to hear the gospel. Amen. Or we got to hear that last tribe in somewhere else to hear the gospel. So once they do, then the world can end. Yeah. Wow. We've heard that before, haven't we? I'm sure we have. Yes. Yes. But that's not what he's talking about at all. I'm going to put a disclaimer. We do have a responsibility. Jesus gave us instruction in Matthew 28 to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all his, command, all his commandments, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That doesn't eliminate, this is not going to eliminate our responsibility to go into the world and make disciples of the nations. But we don't have a responsibility to preach the gospel so Jesus can come back again. Amen. No. This is not what he's saying. He's saying the gospel has to be preached to the whole world before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD will come. Amen. And so there's quite a few verses that we have in our outlines, I believe they're there, that will show us that. Let's look at um, Acts 2, verse 5. Our first one. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Yeah, so at the time of Passover, at the time of Pentecost, who was in Jerusalem? Devout men. From where? Every nation, every nation under heaven. And so they'd heard the gospel. <laughs> they'd already saw what was going on, and I'm sure the crowd was in uproar of what Jesus did in his death. And he rose from the grave. It had to be known. I'm sure it was. Then, I'm sure when Stephen was stoned, just before 70 AD, then we'll see that great persecution came. And everybody in Jerusalem 
were scattered back to their homes. Amen. But until then, they all were staying in Jerusalem. They were learning. They were following Peter, and they went to um, the Gentile and uh, Jewish temple under the portico, and, and were learning of God's truth and of Christ and what happened. Romans 1 8. <clears throat> First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you, for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Speaking of the Romans, who knew of their faith? The who world. was talking about their faith? The known world at that time. The known world of, of that was in existence at the time that this was written. Romans 10.18 but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. So that is the word of God, the preaching. Faith comes by here, and hearing by the word of God, and that word went to the end of the world. Romans 16, 25 and 26. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So here again, at the time... In this period from the cross before 70 AD, all nations knew. All nations knew. Even Paul, he had the school in uh, Tyrannus. And in the school of Tyrannus, it says that all of Asia heard the gospel in the course of two years. Let's go to Colossians 1 5 and 6 and have a, yet another witness of this gospel. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and brings forth fruit as it does also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Praise the Lord. Again, another witness that the gospel had been preached to all the world. Then finally, our last one is in Colossians 1.23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So was the gospel preached to every creature under heaven? Yes. It yes. was, wasn't it? So now we have the gospel had to be preached. Amen. And we've seen many witnesses that said, yes, that was fulfilled before 70 AD when the New Testament was written. Again, does that absolve me from my responsibility to go into the world and make disciples of no. all the nations? No. We still have that great commission that our Lord gave us to accomplish and to fulfill. Beside that, why would we not want to? <laughs> why would we not want to share what God has done in our life? And so here is uh, uh, the gospel had to be preached. Then he says, then the end will come. So then the end will come. Verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then the end shall come. Mm -hmm. What again is the end? The end of the world? The end of the Jewish age. The end of the temple, the end of the, that Jewish age where God spoke to man through the types and shadows, but now it's fulfilled with a spiritual reality and the fulfillment of what Christ was and always intended to do. Verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken by the Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Okay. So now we have learned, I'm going to use this here, that 
Remember our drawing from yesterday, where we learned that the pre-tribs believe that that the church is going to be raptured, then the Antichrist is going to make a covenant, and he's going to come and stand in a rebuilt temple, and he's going to be the Antichrist, because he's the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by Daniel. So the Jew, so many Christians believe this, that the Antichrist has got to stand in the temple, because that, so it has to be rebuilt, and he's going to uh, speak. And here it says, when you see this happen, who's he talking to? <laughs> who's Jesus talking to? Disciples. At that time. Mm -hmm. So what is the abomination that causes desolation? Let's look in um, Luke 21, 20. Luke 21, 20. And we, and when ye shall see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is near. So it's not an antichrist that's going to surround the temple. What is it? Roman armies. Armies. The armies. This is the temple. Luke 21, 20 says... When you see the armies surround that are going to bring the desolation, know the end is near. Let's read another verse for our second witness in Luke 19, 43 and 44. Luke 19, 43 and 44. <clears throat> for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and surround thee round and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Speaking again of the destruction of the temple of the Roman armies. Not an antichrist standing in the temple, claiming himself to be God, not a single man, but the thing that's going to bring the desolation against this temple is the Roman armies because of their disobedience and their rejection, rejection of Christ. And he's going to come and destroy those people, those, that city. So the abomination that causes desolation are the Roman the armies. Roman. Let's go on. Of course, Daniel has spoken of this in Daniel 9, 26. I'm not going to do that, read about that right now. We will study that probably tomorrow. But Daniel prophesied about this abomination that causes desolation. Let's go on to verse 16, Matthew 24, 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. So now here's another Greek word we want to get familiar with. The word then means tote. That's the Greek word. Not toke, tote, <laughs> T-O-T-E. Tote. And tote means at that time or at that same time. So Jesus said there are many will deceive you. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquake. There's going to be persecution. False gospel or false prophets. Gospel has to be preached. The Roman armies are going to surround the city. Then he says, then, at that time, get out of there. Leave. Run. Because the destruction is going to happen. He says, get out to the mountains. So Jesus warns those saints about the coming destruction and flee when the armies appear. History tells us that the Roman armies surrounded Jerusalem, withdrew, then under Titus one year later came back and surrounded Jerusalem and destroyed the city. So they had came in 69 AD, surrounded this nation of Israel, then, um, what was his dad's name? Vitello Vesalius. 
Vespasian. Vespasian. Yes, yeah. he was the Titus's father. He yeah. surrounded him in 69 AD. Then he got called back to Rome because he was crowned the emperor. And then a year later, he sent his son Titus to finish it. So once the Roman army surrounded the city, Titus was called back. Now, there's no proof in the history that I've read, but I believe at that time, everybody in Jerusalem that knew what Jesus taught fled. Yes. And Josephus says not one Christian died during the siege. Amen. Not one. Amen. Why? Because Jesus told them what was going to happen. When you see all these things, flee, get out. Okay, let's go on. And back to Matthew. Then he says in verse 19, And woe unto them that are with child, and who have them give suck in those days. Why? Because... To get out, to flee at this time of persecution, a time of great death and murder, when people were killing and betraying one another, it would be hard to travel with a baby. It's not like you could load them up in the back of the car, put the car seat in, and leave. You had to travel by foot. So Jesus just said, it's going to be difficult. Verse 20, pray that your flight not be in winter. Same thing, because of the travel, or on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, you could pick up a stone. And when you picked up a stone, you could throw it. That's as far as you could walk on the Sabbath. If you walk farther than how far you threw the stone, you would be killed. So he said, pray that it's not on the Sabbath. So you may be able to escape. Verse 21, for then there shall be great tribulation. There's that word tot at that same time. The destruction of the temple, not later in history, but then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world, nor at this time, nor near ever shall be again. So the great tribulation period is over, it's done. And it refers to the mass killing and the sufferings of the Jews. There never been before or after this time, one million people in the city were killed by the sword. One million in that small city were killed. The Jewish zealots were killing their own people, as well during the siege of the city of Jerusalem. There was starvation at this time. This is not the same as the Great Tribulation in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation speaks of the tribulation period from the cross to the second coming. And Jesus said, through much tribulation will we enter the kingdom of God. And so this is referring to a great tribulation that came upon the nation of Israel in 70 AD because their cup was filled. They rebelled against God, and yet for 490 years, God offered mercy. He pled with them. He, 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 like a mother hand, come, I'm ready to accept you. And they were not willing. And so at the end of the 490 year period from Babylon to this time, God had no choice but to pronounce judgment on the nation of Israel. The nation itself was done anyway, because God wasn't going to be have a natural people in a natural kingdom anymore. But they would not accept the reality that this was a spiritual kingdom with a spiritual people that included all mankind and all women. And so they rejected it and God pronounced judgment on that nation of Israel. It's no different than what happened to all the unbelievers from the cross to the second coming at that time of final judgment. And some people think that that's very cruel God that he would do that. The reality is, love is never forced. And so at the time of judgment, it's the second greatest act. I heard Bob Reed say this, the guy that wrote this, the greatest act of love ever displayed in the Bible, one was the cross. The second one was final judgment. Because you're giving them what they wanted their whole life. Selfishness. God can't force himself on you. And the nation of Israel was selfish. They didn't want. They knew who he was. They rejected him. 
So God has given them over to what they wanted their whole lives. Same as final judgment. He's a just God. And he can't force anybody, his love on anybody. It has to be a free will choice. And so here is this great tribulation upon this nation of Israel. And there's many stories that Josephus writes. The one there was a woman. She took her baby and she baked him in the oven to eat the kid. And the Romans came in and said, we smell food. Or the Zealots came in, we smell food. Where is your, where, what are you cooking? Where would you get food? And she presented the ba cooked baby to them and said, I saved the best for you. It made them revolt in horror. So in Josephus, there's, there's stories like this to show you the depth of what was going on, the starvation in, the, in this nation of Israel, and, and particularly Jerusalem at this time. He also says that blood ran down the streets ankle deep because a million people were killed. <clears throat> Verse 22 and except those days should be short, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be so shortened. So God stopped his destruction after about three years. He did it for the elect's sake. For those saints who had fled to the mountain, elect never refers to the na national Jews or the nation in the New Testament, but those who are in Christ. Mm -hmm. Verse 23. Mm -hmm. Then... There is that thing at the same time, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, there is Christ, and there believe it not. For there shall, again, another pronouncement, a warning, there shall false Christ, false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders, and so much that if evil were possible, they would deceive the very elect. The elect were those that had believed in Christ. They, they responded to the call and became the elect, the higher quality or the higher higher than the rest of the old mankind because we are in Christ we're the bride we're chosen mm -hmm. verse 25 behold I have told you beforehand uh, what Jesus does he tells you beforehand what's going to happen mm -hmm. there's no excuse for it, nobody to be left in that in that nation during this time of great tribulation 26, wherefore they, if they shall say, you below, he is in the desert, go forth not, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. And here he's warning believers about men telling you about the various places where Jesus is. To me, this is a very clear reference to a secret rapture. Yeah. <laughs> if he's in a secret chamber, don't believe it. Because right. now he's trans going to transition to the second question, what will be the sign of your coming? So he's saying, hey, look, I've told you what's going to happen. Don't believe it. And if they say Christ is here in the secret chamber, don't believe it. For as lightning cometh the east and the shineth even to the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is gathered, there shall be gathered together. So when Jesus comes, you won't need someone telling you that Jesus has come. Mm -hmm. You'll see him. Jewish, G, verse 28, Jesus now finishes total thought on these previous verses. It's over. So he's answered the first question. And so now he's transitioning. We know it's over because he's completed it. Mm -hmm. So now, therefore, when you see the eagles eating the carcass, don't worry, don't worry. Verse 27, for the lightning comes from the east as the west, so even this shall be the coming of the Son of Man. So now he's transitioning. What is the question to? What's the sign of the end? And so we begin to begin in verse 28 to the rest of the chapter. Answer the second question. No. To recap for our brothers and sisters, what did we see? Jesus was in the temple teaching about the kingdom of Israel, how it was going to be judged because of their sin and their rejection of Christ. 
And the kingdom was going to be taken from them and given to a kingdom that would bring forth fruit. The church, the spiritual kingdom of God. And then he went on and called them, you fools, you vipers. And he really rebuked them. But then he said, look at, just as a mother hen wants to gather her chicks to her. That's what his heart was. Come. But they wouldn't. So now Jesus comes out of the temple where he was teaching. And he tells them that there's going to be not one stone left upon this temple. In 70 AD, judgment would come upon them. Before that happened, you'll see people deceiving you. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be earthquakes. There'll be persecutions. There'll be false prophets. There'll be the gospel preached. Then the armies will surround Jerusalem. Then will come the destruction. And that happened. That was all complete and all fulfilled. Now on your outlines, unfortunately, we don't have anything to add. I'm working on it. I thought it was going to be done. So you might want to find a place to make notes on your outline or somewhere else on a separate piece of paper because we need to answer the second question and the third question in our study. So I think right now I want to take a break because it was a lot, a lot of information there, a lot going on. And so let's stop the camera and take a break.